for the third time, I think, good morning. Um, we're, living, we're living in a, an age of revolution, and we're not really understanding the fact, as is true generally of most revolutions, in which ordinary life for most people carries on, sometimes for months and years, before they realize that the society around them has completely changed. Uh, one way we see the changes, if we pay attention, is, of course, the tearing down of statues, of statues. That's traditional in almost all changes of regime, and of course it happened here in 1989. Another is the way in which language becomes a battlefield, and the battlefield in which uh, words um, we used to use regularly are now forbidden, and words which we don't really understand and don't think make much sense become compulsory. Um, th there has been an example recently in the European Union, um, but not just there. It was also in some corporations in England and America in which a particular phrase became a taboo, a phrase which we have used conventionally for a very long time. I think it has therefore become what I would call a counter-revolutionary phrase, and I'm indebted to... Um, uh, to Rodrigo Ballester here for um, being the first to proclaim this as a, a counter-revolutionary phrase. And that's why I begin, I think for the fourth time this morning, with the words, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Somebody was dismissed from, as, from his job as an announcer on a British Railways train for using that phrase. Um, it's now been uh, gathered, rendered taboo by the European Union. I don't think... The phrase comrades is yet compulsory, but we can see it coming in over the horizon. And these things are very important. Now, they're only one aspect of the revolution that's taking place in our time. And we're here to discuss that and other aspects this morning. We're very fortunate in having one of the intellectual scouts of civilization on the platform, and, and, um, um, and that's Heather MacDonald who is a distinguished American commentator and, 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 uh, and author. Uh, she is the author of the book, which I will now hold up, and some of you will have seen it. Yes, I'm holding it up the right way. Uh, some of you will have seen it and, um, and read it, and some of you are seeing it for the first time. Well, I urge you to, to, um, to go out and buy it. I will say that we will be discussing about a lot about it this morning, but there's always a great deal more in a book than there is in an hour and a half's discussion, and I think you would all benefit greatly by the, the wisdom of, of Heather. Now, um, I, I will say a few words about her formal positions. In, uh, she is a, w, a Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a contributing editor of the City Journal, published by the Manhattan Institute, and one of the three or four uh, most important uh, elements of the new conservative resistance. Um, she has covered the most sensitive topics, and I mean also the particularly racially sensitive topics of crime and race. Uh, she has done so courageously, um, but she has, in my view, never, and she's therefore controversially, but she's never put a foot wrong, and that's something that's very unusual in, in these cases. That hasn't, of course, saved her from what's called being controversial. Um, uh, Heather, um, I want to ask you uh, a question, um, which is, um, I'm sorry, oh, which is um, yeah, uh, about your book. I think it would be helpful if we would begin, if you would begin by giving us two of the three of the major themes of the book and, and giving us an insight into your argument. Um, but particularly, when you've done that, uh, tell us whether this revolution is destined to be a universal one, like the French and Bolshevik revolutions, or can it be successfully resisted um, uh, in countries, for example, this one, which have so far been trying to escape it? Uh, Heather. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jorge Geld. Uh, it's an honor and privilege again to be at the Danube Institute and MCC, and thank you to my fellow panelists for 
trying to read my book. I greatly, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Let me first just give a sense, can you hear me? Is this okay? Of why I wrote this book. It, it grew out of sorrow and rage. Uh, sorrow to see the things that I loved the most dearly in life reduced to the inanities of somebody's gonads and melanin. I was privileged to have been in college in the 1970s. Now that was the reign of deconstruction, post-structuralism, and I was sadly uh, uh, credulous enough to have s absorbed it and become a, a uncritical acolyte of Jacques Derrida and Paul de Man. So I wasted a lot of time reading nonsensical high theory. But the saving grace was identity politics had not yet hit the universities. So while we read books with a very perverse point of view, which was to look for those alleged uh, junctures where m meaning broke down and the, and the book was self-referentially talking about its own impossibility. And I don't expect you to understand what I'm saying because these were nonsensical ideas. But nevertheless, I got to read in my freshman year at Yale, Chaucer, Spencer, Milton, Alexander Pope, William Wordsworth, Coleridge, Wallace Stevens, without anyone thinking to complain about their race and their sex. And now that seems like a prelapsarian age of innocence and, and grandeur. In the 1980s uh, arose an obsession, a, a narcissistic obsession with race and sex. And the, the idea became prevalent that one only read books in order to see one's own identity reflected. And so as a female, uh, one should be reading female authors, or as a black uh, student, one should be reading black authors. The range of imaginative uh, possibility was shrunk to a nullity. It was all about replicating the self and the possibility of losing oneself in worlds that were far greater than anything one could possibly hope to experience in one's own petty life was eliminated. Uh, and so I saw these student yahoos take over the university, insist on replicating their own ignorance by canceling the greatest works of human imagination and civilization in favor of this petty self-involvement. Uh, and so there was sorrow at seeing the thing that I loved the most being trashed and also rage that the faculty, the people who have been given the greatest privilege that one can possibly imagine, which is simply to pass on this civilization, this inheritance to the next generation with gratitude and love and to, to help students understand why they should be down on their knees in gratitude before these monuments of human expression, they were silent. They were either silent or they were complicitous. They let the barbarian hordes trample the thing that it was their privilege to curate, pass on, and explicate. Uh, so I started writing about the, the destruction of the literary imagination and also the destruction of merit uh, as a criterion of advance both within the university and of course outside, and John mentions uh, the very vexed and very taboo issue of race. Uh, and this is hard to understand for a Hungarian audience, but, uh, and, and I'm not gonna go into it in depth right now, we can return to the topic, but the, the big problem in American society today, I would argue, 
is the enduring problem of racial disparities in achievement and in behavior. And this has resulted in standards being torn down within academia, within the law, within corporations, in order to achieve some semblance of racial proportionality in, in faculties and whatnot. And the only allowable explanation in the United States today for the fact that there are not 13% black engineers at Google or Facebook, the only allowable explanation for the fact that in, maybe there's one or 2% at most black engineers is racism. One may not talk about those behavioral and cultural disparities that result today in ongoing racial inequality. The university is the primary engine of that taboo. You are not allowed to all offer an alternative explanation for ongoing racial disparities. And what I am seeing across our culture in the United States today is every single institution is coming down because it either has a predominantly white past, it comes out of Europe, so classical music, its inheritance, its tradition now is viewed as racist because Bach, Beethoven, Schubert, Bartok, Kodai are white. There were no blacks to speak of in Europe at the time that this, this monumental tradition was created. And yet, we now look back, and hilariously, we say that the most important aspect of, of Josquin Dupré, of Couperin, of, of, of Schubert, of Schumann, is their race and their gender. Are you kidding me? I mean, are you kidding me? Each one is unique in its voice, and yet, the only thing that matters is their race and gender. And so the fact that the tradition is white, all you have to say, if you're the New York Times today, to cancel either an individual or an institution is to append the adjective white to that institution or individual. And that's it. You've made your argument. <coughs> so my goal in this book was to both make an argument for the value of our inheritance and the value of meritocracy to push back against the all-consuming narrative that racism is the only allowable explanation for disparities. I also address uh, the inanity, the absurdity of feminism on college campuses and this ridiculous idea that there is an epidemic of campus rape on American universities. I don't know how familiar you guys are, but it is so insane. We're supposed to believe that these college undergraduates who every weekend are trooping off to the fraternity parties, who are deliberately drinking themselves into a state of almost oblivion in order to, to lower their sexual inhibitions. They are deliberately going to these parties. They have a... a, a a, a, a campus hookup, a oh, one night stand, and then the next day they claim they've been raped. And they, the college has now set up a set, set of kangaroo courts without any due process to try males. It is females' vengeance on a civilization deemed too white and too male. They're taking males down as well. Beware. As far as whether this can be stopped. I think maybe that's for later in the discussion. Uh, you know, I would, to me, I'm a pessimist by nature. So take that into account. I think one either is inclined to look on the bright side. John and I have had lovely dinners in, um, in New York City, and he's an optimist by nature. And I, 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 I hear him and I think, are you nuts? Like, <laughs> what grounds for optimism? We haven't won a single cultural battle since the 1960s. 
why do you think we should start winning now? He looks at me and says, but look at all these seeds of hope. Of course we can win. Are you nuts? So that, that kind of predisposition to see the dark side and the bright side, I can't overcome. But I am, I'm not massively hopeful, as was mentioned at a panel yesterday, the, the incipient rebellion against the racialization of the curriculum in K through 12 may give one hope. Also, countries that don't have the American race problem uh, have it a little easier, although I'm told that Hungary is starting to replicate our victim culture with the Roma, which doesn't surprise me one bit. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm gonna let that uh, be batted around by my worthy fellow co-panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, Heather, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'll defend myself on the optimism point <laughs> by saying that I, I actually uh, don't agree with, uh, don't support the concept of optimism. I would say I, I replace it by hope, but hope has in it the fact that you have to do something in order to prevent the worst outcomes. Um, on the other hand, um, yes, we have been doing a great deal, both you and I, not just having dinner, and we haven't yet managed to turn back the tide. That I concede. <laughs> um, and I'd like to turn, uh, uh, having thanked Heather, to um, the uh, three interlocutors. Now, um, Peter Curti um, was born in England, um, he, but he's lived in Australia for, I think, the last 30 years, something. Yeah nearly 30 years. Um, he is a distinguished social critic, um, a legal theorist, and an ordained Anglican clergyman. Um, he is the director of the uh, Program of Culture, Prosperity, and Civil Society at the Center for Independent Studies, which is the largest and most important think tank in Sydney, uh, the largest city in Australia, um, at least the greatest city. He appears frequently as a commentator on radio and television. Um, and he's the author of books like The Tyranny of Tolerance, Threats to Religious Liberty in Australia. Such questions as euthanasia and the culture of death. Um, Peter, um, uh, you're a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Um, you are active as a clergyman in the, um, university, the Episcopal University of um, Australia. You are on the platform, I think you're the only person who is specifically a representative of the Christian churches. Now, on the face of it, the revolution described by Heather um, is hostile, directly hostile to the church, Christian church. Um, or either that or it's a kind of perversion of Christianity, or both. Yet the Catholic church, though theoretically hostile to the wokeness revolution, has actually shrunk from any direct attack on it or any direct conflict with it. And I would argue from outside that the Anglican Church has actually gone a long way in embracing wokeness. At least it has in England. You will tell us about Australia, and I think it's done so in, in America too. Um, why has Christianity proved so weak against this revolution? And um, what should the churches be doing instead? Uh, thank you, John. That's a very interesting question. Uh, and I'm going to start with the word hope that you used, because the, the, uh, the, the political framework, if one can describe it as such, that undergirds the cultural chaos that Heather catalogues in the book is, of course, the politics of identity. And at the heart of politics, the politics of identity, is the notion of transgression, the notion of secular sin, um, and the notion of, of redemption. The problem with identity politics is that transgression is catalogued, uh, transgressors are denounced, but uh, the redemption and restoration to a state of innocence is almost impossible to achieve. Now, one of the reasons some critics think that the politics of identity has taken hold is due to the decline in the belief of God. And one scholar who's done, some, I think, some very interesting work in this is the political scientist Joshua Mitchell, uh, particularly in his book, American Awakening. And Mitchell talks about the way in which belief in God has declined um, and the place of institutional religion has been displaced. Um, and in place has come the politics of identity, which uses much of the framework of, as I say, transgression, uh, redemption, and restoration, but without any of the possibilities. Because, of course, 
uh, he, he, I mean, religious belief would teach that it's the God, it's God's, it's God or the gods who can only restore human beings uh, from their uh, from their fallen state of grace. That we ourselves can't do this. Uh, so there's a, I think, a, a great discrepancy. Now that you're right about the churches, I think the the, I mean, church, Christians don't agree about much. It seems these days, and so. Even within churches, there are differences of opinion. But in the Anglican church to which I belong, I think there's been a very worrying embrace of the politics of identity, starting with the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, uh, Justin Welby. But it, and it trickles all the way down. There are bastions that hold out against this. But in my view, rather than standing against the politics of identity and say, well, actually, there's something really wrong here, because, uh, the, the, I mean, there, the church is going to say, well, we understand how religion and religious belief works. We understand transgression, and, and this is what we believe. They've abandoned that and seem to find that the, the politics of identity is the new gospel, as it were, that provides the new framework whereby uh, Christians can express their, their repentance, can pray for uh, redemption, and, and, and live with a form of hope. But, and this is, brings me back to the word hope, I think it's a very corrupted notion of hope that politics of identity uh, offers because I don't think uh, restoration is simply, is simply possible. And Heather catalogues this so well in her book that there's nothing you can do. Once, once you are deemed uh, a sinner, once you are deemed an oppressor, uh, once you are deemed to have harmed a victim, there is nothing that you can do. And the politics of identity tears down, uh, puts nothing in its place. Thank you very much indeed. Um, my next, our next speaker is Dr. Callum Nicholson. Uh, Callum is a fellow both at the Danube Institute and here at MCC. He has an academic background in anthropology um, and in human geography. Uh, he has conducted original research on how we understand the social implications of such topics as climate change, notably in relation to migration and international development. Um, I can add a lot of things about the kind of work you do, but I would say that implied in all your work is a concern for the relationship between truth and power, a question all the more relevant uh, in the uh, post-truth age. So. You've lived in universities through the, many, the period which many of the changes described by Heather um, have been taking place. And um, um, one important element in your work is very relevant. It's what I would call, perhaps you wouldn't accept this, theoretical or linguistic demystification. Um, you examine what people are saying and then you suggest what it is they really mean and, and, um, and what the arguments are directing towards. Maybe something better, maybe something worse, but different. How do you deconstruct diversity, inclusion, and equity? What do they really mean in terms of practice? Well, first of all, uh, good morning, or maybe good afternoon. It's still morning, I think. So, uh, but thank you, John, it's very generous. You also made me sound almost like a post-structuralist in the description, <laughs> so. Uh, um, yeah, that's what I was thinking, but um, yeah, I'm not necessarily opposed to Foucault, but, uh, but I think I diverge on a, a number of issues. Um, I mean, in terms of my experience, when I was an undergraduate, I remember I was, my, uh, a lot of my, the older lecturers were very much the top end of the people who'd been started teaching in the 60s. And, uh, but if you go back to universities now, they're very, very different cultures. That sort of flinty, old school sense of you earn the professor's respect is gone. Now they are desperate for your validation because you're filling out an audit form if you're a student to tell them how well they're doing their job, which is surprising because when you go to university, you assume you're going there to get their validation, but things seem to have changed. But I have a couple of questions for, for Heather. Um, uh, one, a sort of an analytical question with your framework and another sort of a devil's advocate question. Um, and the first one is, I think a lot of this, the, the woke ideas we see are uh, clearly philosophically, if you root their as Foucault would say, the genealogy. It goes back through um, you know, a left-wing academic, post-1968 academia, the stuff you were talking about, Foucault, Mann, and so on. Um, the, and that's true. But it does seem to me that the proliferation of this in the culture the last few years has been more economic than it's been uh, political. And it seems to be driven largely by HR departments, for instance, um, uh, throughout different corporations and institutions. And it's very interesting that if you look at the way these discussions are conducted, they seem quite neoliberal in their structure. 
um, because uh, you know the challenges to old books it's almost like planned obsolescence built into the the canon people are now seeing that we need to progress these ideas they're never good enough in themselves we need a new version you know we need a new iPhone you need a new book the old book won't do anymore um, we also see sort of I ideological consumerism every few months there's a new fad of what is the virtuous position to have is that just people uh, engaging in a form of conspicuous ideological consumerism um, we also see uh, in these people gaining uh, or articulating themselves through these abstract identities uh, and these slogans you see on Twitter and so on. That seems to me almost like uh, identity entrepreneurism. And, and finally, when you see people trying to uh, um, bring together, very, to, to measure their relative victimhood and to gain new identities of their, how they've suffered in some way, uh, that almost seems like a kind of a conglomeration, you know, like a corporation conglomerates for more power. Now, the more victim statuses you can claim, the more power you have in the discourse. So I'm wondering in this, the, the analytical question is, I, understand, I completely agree with you that there, there is a problem in society with a lot of this, uh, the, these um, identity politics and woke ideas. Um, but I wonder, are those problems the symptom or are they the disease? In the sense that when you have a disease, the symptoms are the things that can often kill you. But to secure the disease, which is leading to the symptoms, you need to diagnose what is the disease. And I, and I suppose my question here is, is the disease, I understand and agree with you that it has philosophical roots in the ideology, but perhaps is the ideology rather arbitrary and the real conditions under which we are suffering these problems is more an economic system of, of the neoliberal uh, approach where that we're no longer ends in ourselves, we're always means to ends in a sense. And the second question, very short, devil's advocate question is, where you talk about people who are often claiming victim status, of course the counter argument from the other side would be conservatives are constantly claiming a victim status and saying we haven't won a culture war in decades. What would your response be to that? Well, I'll take the, the f second question first. Uh, yes, I have gotten that accusation when I merely describe uh, the incidents that I've been a part of in college campuses. You know, the, the, the uh, blockades, the walkouts, the screaming fits, the being escorted off campus by the police, and and the right, the left will come back at me and say, "Ah, you're claiming victim status." I am not. I'm. How can one? It makes it impossible to simply empirically describe what has happened. I I don't think I'm a victim. I'm just saying that there are people out there, especially college students, who are rank idiots. Uh, they they don't understand their own privilege, and they are desperate for the power that you speak about, which is the power of negation. These are people who cannot create anything. It is very easy to destroy. Uh, and it is, it is an aphrodisiac to destroy, to tear down the statutes, to, to tear down the canon. Uh, so how, how can I describe what is going on and not be put in a category of saying I'm, I'm claiming a victim? being victimhood. I'm not. How can you say that we have lost every battle? That's not the same thing as saying that you're a victim. It is merely empirically describing what is going on. Uh, you'd have to lie to say we have, we have won. To say you're, you've lost means you're a victim doesn't. No, it means that you have not won that war. As far as the economic analysis, if I can sort of restate, this is a explanation that is being advanced by some very sophisticated conservative writers that the whole woke thing is simply a way of big corporations to pay off the left uh, and be able to pr continue their predatory capitalism, cover that up under the, the guise of being left wing by, by caring so much about these trivial cat categories, uh, and especially the promotion of gays. There's been a whole argument. Who first uh, advanced, I don't know if it was Patrick Deneen, that uh, they're, they're anti-family and, and they want deracinated consumers, and the, the, the most uh, valuable consumer are gays because they have a lot of spending power because they don't have children. That's an argument that's out there. I reject that. I do not think that what's going on is simply an economic 
uh, generated uh, uh, superstructure falsification. I think these people really believe it. It is an ideological problem, not an economic one. And again, in the American context, I think the, the driving force is America's ongoing discomfort about race and racial disparities. If I can just throw some numbers out there. Uh, the average black 12th grader reads at the level of the average white 8th grader. 54% uh, of black 8th graders do not possess even partial mastery of 8th grade math. They, they're not even, they're below basic in their math skills. Uh, those gaps never close. And so we have the ludicrous idea, again, that the only reason that there are not black engineers is because of racism is, is impossible. Given the academic skills gap, you can only achieve proportional representation by completely wiping out meritocratic standards. We are involved in the United States today in a massive unwinding of the criminal justice system. There is hardly a single law that is not being deconstructed, to use John's phrase. We're not enforcing theft, we're not enforcing shoplifting, we're not enforcing resisting arrest, we're not enforcing trespass. Why? Because to enforce the law in a colorblind fashion, and I'm going to use colorblind with, 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 with a, a caveat to understand Joshua's point yesterday, which I think is very right, but, but let's just use it in brackets. You cannot enforce the law without having a disparate impact on blacks, not because the criminal justice system is racist, but because the rates of criminal offending are so exponentially higher. Blacks in the United States die of homicide at 13 times the rate of whites. Why? Because they commit homicide at 13 times the rate of whites. They're killing each other. It's not police officers who are killing blacks. It's not whites who are killing blacks. It's other blacks. Something that is unthinkable to a Hungarian audience. In Chicago, somebody is shot in a drive-by shooting in less than every two hours. Every, less than every two hours, there is a drive-by shooting that is taking down children, the elderly. Somebody is killed in Chicago every 14 hours. And Chicago is not our most dangerous city. Baton Rouge, Louis, Louisville, Detroit is. So our only explanation for this is racism. We cannot talk about those disparities. I think that that is what is generating this the elites are terrified that the racial achievement gaps and behavior gaps are never going to close. We've been trying to close them for the last five to six decades with massive amounts of transfer payments. Great society programs, entitlement programs, it has not worked. The elites are terrified that they're not going to close, and so they are prophylactically, they are preemptively putting out as the only allowable explanation racism. Uh, and you cannot talk, as I say, about behavior or culture. So as far as I'm concerned, that, that terror is what is driving the identity politics and the attack on meritocratic standards. Could I just come in on this point? I'm sure Callum will want to, but um, there is one aspect of this which is very, very curious, which is whenever you have um, the, 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 the results of these policies um, uh, 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 affecting the black communities themselves so badly, you get in those communities a very often a strong response, as in recently over defunding the police, to object to the ultra-liberal policies imposed by the elites. Why does that particular response from the black communities themselves receive so little attention from the elites. You would think, given their rhetoric, that they would respond strongly to it. I know, people like me and other people around on this, we keep saying, but, 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 black lives matter. I thought black lives matter. 
Last year, we saw the largest one-year increase in homicide in the United States history, nearly 30%. Those of you who are statisticians know that a 30% change in a year is off the charts. Nothing ever changes in 30%. Another several thousand blacks were murdered. Blacks are always the majority of murder victims in the United States, even though they're 13% of the population. Again, why? Because they're killing each other off in these barbaric drive-by shootings. F oh, at least 50 black children, one-month-olds, one-year-olds, six-year-olds, black children all were gunned down last year in their beds, at barbecues, in their front yards, in the backyards, at porches. The Black Lives Matter activists said not a peep about this. They have never protested a black-on-black -black killing, never. They've never protested the elderly blacks being, being shot down. I go to police community meetings in East Harlem, in central Brooklyn, and I hear these wonderful elderly black ladies in these fantastic hats stand up and burst out spontaneously, apropos of nothing, how lovely when we see the police. They are my friends. Those voices never get covered by the mainstream media. I, I, I can describe it. I can only hypothesize because, again, it undercuts the narrative of fundamental racism, which is so profoundly important to the left. Uh, it's not to say that there are not lots of black leftist activists who keep going. You know, I think a safe harbor for white conservatives is that all of this is just the, the product of white elites. It's not. I mean, let's be honest. There's a lot of blacks who are also on board the victimization game. Uh, but, but it is absolutely the case that one is not allowed to speak about the toll of crime in black communities. Last year, there were a total of four unarmed blacks killed by the police last year out of a population of 40 to 44 million blacks. And we're supposed to believe that there's an epidemic of police shootings of unarmed blacks. Are you kidding me? It's the same thing with campus rape. So uh, it's... Uh, the elites are not willing to give up their ideology. Thank you. Uh, Callum, I think you want to come back. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious that the, um, uh, I mean, I take your point with the, uh, I don't think racism explains all problems. Racism is clearly an issue, but I, this notion that it's the only uh, lens through which to view things seems uh, at the very least simplistic, I've always felt, particularly the last two years. And I'm wondering, what would be your diagnosis? I mean, one thing I've noticed in the last few years that's fallen out of the culture is a discussion of something that dominated global politics of the 20th century, which was class. It was class problems. So one thing we're not talking about now in the UK is the class-based nature of a lot of the divisions. When people talk about particular minorities, I know Britain better than the States, in the UK when people talk about particular minorities uh, suffering and being marginalized, they're not just uh, uh, that minority. They're often the underclass of that minority. They're the working class. But actually, I grew up in a, in a very remote part of England uh, near Whitehaven. Uh, in fact, uh, when they next to this town of Workington, and I remember in the election in 2019, there was the idea of Workington Man. You know, Workington Man would, you know, what, what does he want? And that was basically my local town. And it's a really destitute, uh, deprived former mining area. And I think it's 99% white, and it's destitute. And the problems they have are, are, are very similar to lots of the other communities, uh, who like the marginal communities who, in the current culture, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter and so on has looked at these minority communities and said they are suffering and need, uh, they need some sort of uh, recourse. But actually, the same problems are being experienced in poor white communities. But the thing that united them was class. And the working class movements used to un unite these things in Britain. What's happened to class? Do you think that's still a valid frame of reference? Do you, think we've, do you think it's fallen out of fashion for good reasons? Or do you think it's something we've lost and we've lost something in our analysis because of that? Well, I'm just going to answer quickly because I want to hear from Rodrigo. You know, I, I uh, the conservatives, a conservative trope is cultural Marxism. That's the explanation for identity politics. I reject that. I actually would rather have good old-fashioned Marxism than what we've got now. I think it's kind of interesting. It is far more interesting to talk about society in terms of railroad workers, you know, railroad magnates, uh, uh, you know, 
business owners, mercantile, the mercantile class, those are interesting categories. They, they, you're, you're doing something. As has been said, being black or being female or being gay is not an accomplishment. It's not a particularly interesting thing about myself. I'm sorry. Uh, so I don't think what we've got here is, is related to Marxism because it is not economic, as you say. So I think the phrase, I would retire cultural Marxism as a phrase. Um, one explanation is, yes, you're right. One problem with a working class focus is you're talking about white people. And whites are now evil. Now, I realize I'm sort of that which is the cause and which is the effect. But I want to invoke the work of Tony Daniels, uh, Theodore Dalrymple, who has, I think, rejected an economic determinism and has brought the discussion back relentlessly to personal responsibility. And yes, there are uh, economic distinctions and outcomes, but I think the problem in America today with our class differences in economic inequality is a failure of personal responsibility. People are making very, very poor choices, and it is just as specious to blame everything on racism or sexism as it is to blame uh, bad economic outcomes on a, uh, a predatory capitalist system. You only need to do three things in the United States to have a 75% chance of not being poor. This is called the success sequence. This was known in the 1990s, nothing has changed. You graduate from high school. This is our secondary school, pre-college. You don't need to go to college. You work full time and you don't have children out of wedlock. Do those three things and you are not likely to be poor. And nobody wants to talk about those behaviors either. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Heather. Uh, I'm going to move on, since we have um, 44 minutes left, to our final commentator, uh, Rodrigo, uh, Rodrigo Ballester, um, needs very little introduction to this audience, since, um, or indeed at the, at the European Union, since he's head of the European Studies Department here, and he spent a number of years in all of the, as far as I can see, all of the institutions of the European Union. Uh, and all its branches. And I think it's fair to say that the EU now probably regards him as its most discriminating and well-informed critic. Um, so um, you're a lawyer, Rodrigo, uh, you're an economist, and you're, you speak five languages, a linguist, therefore. Um, can I ask you this question? Um, uh, the, the diversity illusion is something that's actually, at the moment, propagated by the European Union uh, officially, politically, and uh, in other ways. Um, uh, more nervously, I think, by its intergovernmental institutions than by the Parliament, but still propagated. Uh, it's presented as, quote, European values, unquote, which we, all of us, have a duty to observe and follow. Um, so, since most people, do not follow all of the, so, so to speak, European values. There are lots, you can ask a series of questions in opinion polls and you'll find that the populations reject some or all of these ideas. Um, so how have we reached the state of affairs in which this revolution is being propagated from um, the bureaucratic center of the European concept? Um, and and um, how can the rest of us, how did it happen, why? And what can the rest of us do about it? Thank you, John, for your uh, kind words, first of all. And um, just before I answer this, uh, this question, a little parenthesis on hope and optimism, I side with you. I'm, more, I'm, I'm rather on the hopeful side of life. Uh, why? For many reasons, because there are signs. Second, because there's the only valid answer. Uh, if you really want to resist, I mean, if you don't have hope, then don't even try to do that. And also because, uh, like it or not, Heather, books like yours and, and, uh, and speeches like yours give a lot of hope. Because the fact that you survived you know, in the US, that you are able to come to Budapest, to speak up as you did yesterday, to speak, for example, about black, black privilege, which is an anathema in your country. I mean, you, could, you would have been sued there directly within five minutes. 
the fact that you spoke about Rabelais, about Pantagruel, about Gargantua, you just spoke about Couperin, things like that, like it or not, give a lot of hope. Your book is a hope machine, basically, it's a hope factory. So that's why you're, 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 you're part of the answer and part of the, of the responsibility. On the, on the European um, Union, John, it's true that it's, first it is a fact, it is a fact. Huh? You, you quoted at the very beginning of this uh, panel these guidelines on inclusive, inclusive communication. And once they got caught there, they said, no, but that was a work in progress. You know, those are things that will not apply anyway. We need to rework them, of course. It was not to our standards. The problem is that uh, you can also track like all the dogmas and all the litany of the work ideology and 10 other public documents that have been really adopted in a very collegial way. And here I only speak about the European Commission because it will take me basically three hours to speak only about the European Parliament. So let's, you know, discard them from the discussion as a matter of time. And it's true that uh, this craze is, is real. I mean, I, I can quote you some, uh, some official positions of the European Commission, but for example, on unconscious bias, on critical race theory, on the fact that our European culture is systematically racist. And by the way, how disconnected you need to be in order to do that, because I mean, how can you explain to the Baltic states, to the Central Europe, that they are racist when they never had a colony in their life? When basically, I mean, today, walking in the countryside, uh, in a Baltic country with a person of color, I mean, then do that, and then you will have children getting out of their houses to have a look, because it will be the very first black person they will ever see. And so to, it also shows like this narcissism and this, uh, this, this uh, yeah, narcissism of also Western Europe, as if in Central Europe they had exactly the same history and the same problems. You can also find sentences as nice as this one in official commission papers, for example, that the commission will boost self-determination of gender without age limit. Does that mean testosterone on kids who are seven or eight, for example, on young girls? I mean, I sometimes wonder if they really, really realize what they are writing and what they are saying. Uh, I don't know what happened. I mean, I think par part of this woke craze is indeed the collective delirium. It uh, cannot explain it from a rational point of view. I mean, when I see that the best universities in the U.S. have been totally hijacked and totally under uh, the hypnosis, I think sometimes it's hypnosis, I have the impression, you know, of this ideology, I'm still puzzled. I cannot explain why. And indeed, the same applies to the European uh, Union official discourse. I still don't understand why. Uh, but in the, in, it is definitely the case. And again, it's not because they got caught once on, this, uh, on these guidelines that is, the things are not going on anyway. Um, look at, for example, the, the really infamous campaign they had on the happy hijab, on the happy burqa, basically. That was, uh, it created really a storm in France because at least the French are very alert to those things. Um, let me still give you some hints, more question marks, but still some hints about what this is happening. Um, and also I, can, I also come back to the, some of the words that you say there, there as well, is that um, I have the impression that wokeism is first of all uh, intellectual laziness and bureaucracy can also contribute to intellectual laziness. You know, when you, don't, you only have time for procedures, you stop having time to think about ideas. And I think the problem number one of uh, the European Union today, and also big corporations, and also big international organizations, is that there is too much bureaucracy. And when basically, when they pay you to implement processes and not, instead of having your own ideas, ooh, somehow that cannot be good for your brain. Uh, second is also something about the management of prosperity. You describe this craze uh, either also as a, as a problem of spoiled brats. You mentioned gratitude several times. And it's true that it's very paradoxical to see that the best, the, the luckiest generation in history, the luckiest generation of women, for example, the luckiest generation of sexual minorities, are the ones that are complaining the most. I don't get it. And it's true that, uh, so, it seems that prosperity can become a problem when you have it all, when you become a spoiled brat, when you become a spoiled teenager, you, that, then you start being totally ungrateful. Does my analogy also apply to societies or to nations? I think the woke ideology is actually an evidence of that. We are first and foremost spoiled brats. Huh? 
and especially this, uh, well, I don't know how they call it now, the millennials. Millennials are definitely a big bunch of spoiled brats. And by the way, just a little parenthesis for my students. I, uh, what Peter Bogosian said the other day, that we have to be ready to stand up, to be punched, and to punch back. You know? I think this is something that you definitely, you know, those who are vaccinated against this craze will have to do in the future. Um, and also referring also to what you said yesterday about uh, you know those, those riots against some professors in uh, in, in Yale. I mean, uh, dear students, don't you dare canceling me, okay? <laughs> because I will push back as well, okay? So that's not going to happen in MCC, certainly not. Uh, and so. And so there, is, it's true that I, I'm, I'm still very puzzled about those things, but now maybe to, to, to play also the, a bit the, the devil's advocate and to come back to you know, this Marxist reading of reality. In France, for example, which is a country I know well, it's a fact it's a, that's been statistically proven that if you have an Arab name, you have less chances to get a job, for example. And I still believe that part of the explanation of why you have so few black engineers it's also because maybe it's easier for a son of an engineer to become one than for the son of a, of a working, black working class uh, person in the banlieue of Detroit, for example. So maybe there, there are, can we also assume that there are somehow some disparities, some structural inequalities, and maybe the, the, it's also for the government to do something about it? It's, I've, it's, uh, apologies for being a little Marxist today, but... I still think it's you know, part of the explanation. What do you think about it? And so one thing is the victimization. Oh, it's racism and it's because I'm black. But if you read between the lines and we get a bit more granular, maybe there are some inequalities that are difficult to be overcome without a little nudge or a little push from public authorities. What, what, what do you think about it? Well, you, I, I see you raising your microphone. I don't want to dominate, but I, OK, all right. Uh, obviously, you know, it would be blind to say that all children start out with identical circumstances and identical opportunities. There are uh, real class differences. Uh, but there's two problems with our current response to that. Uh, the solutions that we've come up with don't work. Uh, and, and it is, which is what I spoke about briefly yesterday, the mismatch problem. If you, as a, a solution to the fact that there are not a proportional number of qualified uh, blacks who can compete to get into Harvard or Yale or university, and, and this is not just an elite problem, like the Americans like to believe that sometimes you hear, oh, it's just the elite universities in America have been infected. No, that's not the case. This goes all the way down. The entire system, down to community colleges, is infected by this poison. Uh, the solution that we've had, which is to say, well, therefore, we will have racial preferences and admit you uh, because you haven't had sufficient opportunities doesn't work. It, it just perpetuates the failure. Uh, and I would also say that we have been trying for decades to use government power and government resources to close those gaps, to equalize opportunity, and it has not worked. We know as, a, as an empirical matter that Public schools in inner cities are funded on a per capita student basis at vastly higher rates than suburban schools. We're pouring money into this. We've had desegregation orders, you know, forcing busing. It has not worked because what is left out of that equation is a change in culture. When you have black kids raised with the culture, a stigma against what's called acting white. So if you're a black student and you take your textbooks home to do your homework, you're acting white. If you try to achieve and stay out of gangs, you're acting white. As long as that ethic is pervasive, there is no amount of external structural change that can happen. 
As far as the resume studies that Rodrigo mentions and whether it's an Arab name or a black name, they, are, they can be questioned on their, on their uh, methodology, but I will just stipulate for the sake of argument that there are disparities that, that employers that see an obviously black name or an obviously Arab name may be less willing to put that person through. That is horrible on an individual basis. That is discrimination. I will only make the very dangerous argument that it is a, those employers are working on statistical generalizations that are not without basis. And the solution there is to overcome uh, those skills and behavior gaps, which I think at this point can only be done through individual effort uh, and not to mandate racial quotas because those only perpetuate whatever remaining stereotypes there are. You can talk to people in American corporations and if they're honest, they will tell you about the affirmative action hires, the racial preference hires that the corporation has brought in that are not competitively qualified. They are then, the pressure is on to promote. And if that affirmative action hire doesn't do well and leaves, you've got a lawsuit on your hands for racial discrimination. Even though the problem was is that person was not competitively qualified. So we can talk about these differences of opportunities. I can tell you America has been trying to close them indefinitely. I don't know one Republican wealthy donor in New York City. I don't know one hedge fund manager, one private equity manager who is not doing social uplift programs up the gazoo. Chess programs in Harlem, tutoring, you name it. We have been trying. At this point, there needs to be reciprocal uh, effort being made. Thank you very much indeed. We've now come to the end of the first part of the meeting because we've reached, uh, we've reached 30 minutes. To go. We've now got 30 minutes to go. So I'm going to throw open the discussion to questions from the floor. Um, may I ask, is, is there, a, is there a, a, a microphone around so that, which will follow? Yes. That, there's the young lady with the microphone. Keep your eye on her. And just behind you, miss, there's a, a, man, a man who wants to ask the question. Could you say who you are and, and explain? Yes, thank you. Sure, hi. Thank you so much for the great panel. Uh, my name is Paul Coleman. I lead the organization ADF International. And I'm just constantly fascinated by this question of, of hope and also uh, the, the patterns that you've obviously clearly articulated, Heather. And we're talking about it all the time. I was in a meeting with my team this week just projecting about what the year 2050 might look like and trying to spot where we are in this journey. So I would just love to hear your predictions on where we are in this cultural moment in terms of has it bottomed out? We all think probably not. So we've got some way to go yet. But from your perspective, Heather, and then perhaps John from a more hopeful perspective, uh, what are we looking at here? If there's going to be a turnaround, are we talking about in 10 years, in 50 years, in 400 years? Um, what do the panelists think? First, Heather, and then I think we'll go from Rodrigo and along. I can only say what is, if we're going to turn it around, what has to happen. I, I can't predict whether that happens. But what has to happen is people not being scared, having some balls, standing up for what is the truth, not apologizing, not backing down and being willing to offer alternative explanations for, as I say, I, I, I sound like a broken record, but I do, my perception of things is that the engine of things in the United States, at least, is these racial gaps, and not, not accepting racism as the only explanation. If that doesn't happen, things are happening very fast. I was talking with Joshua this morning. Every single day, there is some new claim of racism and bigotry. There is some new institution that is being dragged down. We are introducing in the United States mediocrity into our fundamental institutions. That's happening 
most concernedly on the judiciary. You know, we had Biden famously saying he was promote, promising that he would promote a black female judge. That represents black females are 2% of the, of the lawyers in the United States. He's ruling out 98% of all qualified can, possibly qualified candidates. Possibly that 2% by some statistical aberration contains a disproportionate number of the most qualified, but likely not, and given what we know about the law academic achievement gaps, even less likely. But we are putting our jurisprudence at risk by hiring possibly people who are not competitively qualified. That's happening in airplanes. Do not feel sanguine about the fact that United Airlines has announced it is going to be hiring by sex and race in the future. That should not make you feel happy about flying because those are irrelevant <laughs> attributes. Every time it is statistically inevitable, every time you introduce a attribute into your hiring criterion which is not related to the job at hand, you will, as a statistical matter, lower the caliber of the candidate pool. And so if we don't stop this, we are moving towards mediocrity, and China is going to eat our lunch because they are fanatically obsessed with merit in STEM. They don't give a damn about sex and race. They are promoting their top math talent in the United States. We're ending gifted and talented math programs. We're ending uh, specialized high schools exam cycles for the same reason, disparate impact. Uh, so in, in 2050, if this doesn't change, we are looking at a civilization that is not just in decline, but it is affirmatively dangerous. Uh, Rodrigo. Yes, on the forecasts, I have two scenarios, basically, on an institutional level and more on the social level. On the institutional level, and for example, coming back to the European Union, I'm, I can be very pessimistic because I even see the risk of a schism you know, the way we had a schism between Catholics and Protestants 500 years ago, basically, it seems to me now that there is a risk of a schism at the European Union between those who are very progressive and those who refuse to be progressive. The European Union should have never been dragged into those questions because to start with, they belong to the national level. We forgot subsidiarity, too bad. It's going to be, it's going to be to backfire on the European Union, certainly. When you reach the point of conditioning 7 billion or 24 billion euro of a recovery fund on questions that are more moral than actually legal, which is happening now, and we had the, the, the case of the European Court of Justice yesterday, which I still have to read, so I don't want to say too much about it, but still, you know, that can really create a divide. Because when you are sending the message that on, uh, you, uh, in order to be a good European, you need, for example, to promote gender theories in schools, that can be, again, the beginning of a schism, of a separation that will take decades at least to, to resolve. At the social level, I'm more optimistic because I still believe in common sense. Common sense is a powerful vaccine. You have more common sense, for example, in Central Europe because in Central Europe, they know how history, how tragic history can be. They know how you know, pain in the neck communism can be. And so they're somehow vaccinated against that. But for example, for how long will women put up with the fact of being called menstruators? For how long will women put up with the fact that castrated men can win all their uh, swimming competitions? Yeah. At some point, you know, people will be fed up with very, very basic things like that. And then, let me give you a precedence of counter hope, I would say. Who would have said in France in 1960 that eight years later, during a two months of a student's riot, that would have triggered the cultural revolution that basically totally undermined France today. I'm extremely skeptical and critical of May 68, of May 68, but again, no one saw it coming. And so basically, in two months of riots, basically two months, it ended in May because in June they were on holidays. Huh? But those two months totally changed the, uh, the composition and the cultural you know, like, uh, perception in France. Why wouldn't we be now eight years away from a type of anti-woke May 68. We don't know. We don't see the spark now, it's true. But again, think about the, the super young people today. If you are 13 or 14 years old today and you have been totally like, uh, you know, like uh, ingurgitated 
with this new cult called wokeism, basically day and night, day and night, you can also have a hope for a counterculture, for a counter-revolution, because you're fed up of that. You know, it, uh, it's, it's almost inquis it is inquisitorial, absolutely inquisitorial. So again, those things might also uh, backfire. So that's why at the social level, I'm rather optimistic. I admit that at the institutional level, when you see the level of uh, how rotten are the, the, basically the best universities, the international organizations, the, um, the elites, uh, to say it in one word, then, oh my God, I'm really not ho hopeful about them. But about the common sense, yes. It's maybe because this morning I was, I was answering to, in, writ in written to some interviews from uh, uh, against, uh, against, yeah, on the Justin Trudeau and so, I don't know, when I see sometimes the common sense of some truck drivers in Canada versus the total madness of the Canadian's elite, of course it gives you hope. Yes. Um, Callum? Oh. Would you Sorry. Sure. Um, well, I was just thinking, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, will it take uh, years or decades or centuries to come back to normal? And um, this is something, uh, well, I think it's a very interesting historical analogy for what's happening. Um, in the 1450s, a printing press was invented. Within a few decades, you had the Reformations. Carlos Iyer, the Princeton historian of the Reformations, has written how without the printing press, you could not have had the Reformations. Of course, the reformations then led to 200 years of war in Europe, which led to then the 30 years war, you led to the invention of the nation state, and, and, uh, and indeed the enlightenment itself, I think to some extent can be argued uh, to be a, uh, and I know some historians have argued this, that it's to be, it's a, it was a way of bringing some discipline to the sudden proliferation of different perspectives that came out of the, the invention of the printing press, which we saw particularly through the reformations. Now, by analogy, you can kind of, I mean, we shouldn't talk about the dark ages, it's analytically not very true, but it's, it's probably true to say the invention of the printing press took an underexposed picture and made it slightly better exposed because the more perspectives you get, the clearer the picture. Um, but I think the problem we're dealing with now is that in the last few decades, we've had the internet invented and social media. And I think what was happening is a symmetrical thing that uh, to, to what happened with the printing press and the reformations. I say what's happening now is the deformations. And, it, and what's happening with that is, instead of an underexposed picture becoming better exposed, we're having a reasonably well-exposed picture becoming overexposed. And as any photographer knows, an underexposed and an overexposed picture amounts to the same thing. It's an unclear picture of what's going on. So I think we're in an age of deformations. And it's interesting, it's happening exactly, exactly 500 years on from the Reformations. And, it's, and I would argue that the Reformations began the modern era, and the printing press obviously had a role in that. And this is ending the modern era. What comes next is the big question. How long will it take to refine some stability is the big question. Um, how do we deal with overexposure? And I think one thing that needs to happen is to us to reconsider the role of education, particularly in democracies. Education for centuries has been about teaching people to find knowledge, hang on to it, transmit it. Because if, you, if the book was burnt, the knowledge was lost. It's very hard to destroy information now. We, we don't have an issue of underexposures to knowledge now. Well, we, we are not trying to cast light into the darkness. We are trying to filter the light. Because the problem is now when you go on the internet, the problem isn't you can't find the information. You have so many different perspectives that it's hard to work out what's true. We used to live in a, a world of, for a few centuries of, of authorities. Now that has good and bad elements. But you had disciplinary authorities, certain gatekeepers to knowledge. Now we just live in a world of authors. We used to have truth, and it's contested what truth means, but it's certainly, there was a debate about it. Now everyone just says they have their own truth. There is no debate. And that's, that's very concerning. It's overexposure. So I think that the, all these phenomena we're talking about, and you so eloquently talk about in the book, they're, they're, for me, I think that the important thing to, to, to recognize is I think the, the technological context or the, or the change in our communications technology which is allowing this to happen, this proliferation of ideological contagion across the internet, because so many of these, these manias, and they are manias, they are, they are spreading like diseases. Uh, you know, I, I was saying this in a previous panel, but the, you know, if the plane is, can be seen as a vector for biological contagion, the internet is a vector for ideological contagion. And it's worth remembering that you know, the word epidemiology, the study of disease that we're so familiar with now, its real meaning was the study of what is upon the people. And that doesn't just reply to bi uh, apply to biology, it's also ideology. And uh, so I think we, we could reflect on, we need to, you know, if we're going to 
ask about what's happening in 50 years. So much of it's up to us, but first we need to diagnose what the problem is. And one of the dangers, I think, of a lot of the discussions around these ideological issues, um, uh, and, and it is a tricky issue in these debates, is that there's a difference between describing a problem, or indeed stating there is a problem, and explaining the problem. And, and yes, I think we can all agree that the woke stuff's a problem. My concern is, well, why has it proliferated now in the way it has? It's not just because the philosophy is so convincing. As Rodrigo said, there, there's actually incoherent philosophy. It's not because it's a compelling philosophy. There's something else happening ambiently which is driving people to these sorts of incoherencies. But also, there's a certain technology that's allowed people to access it who couldn't before. And, and I think it's the, uh, and we, we see it around us, so this technology. So um, I think we, we need a, to, to, to see where we're going to be in a few decades, I just think we need to understand the nature of the problem. I don't think as a society we're very good at doing that because we're too partisan in our analysis sometimes. Uh, uh, but I, I think we need a more dispassion around it, uh, to be honest. Peter? I think one can be hopeful and live with hope, even if you're not quite sure how that hope is going to be realized or when. So I, I do think hope is important. I don't doubt for one moment that we are in the midst of, of great, possibly civilizational uh, change. I think technology has a very important part to play in this. Um, it, you mentioned the, the printing press and the Reformation, Callum. Interesting enough, um, the historian Barbara Tuchman would go further back than the printing press, and she argued that it was the Black Death in Europe in the 14th century that actually began the process that led to the Reformation because of the changes it imposed upon communities and social structures and their relationship between um, parish villages and their parish churches. Uh, we have a pandemic now, 100 years after the Spanish flu. I don't doubt for a moment that we will see great social change. There are debates about the, the future of democracy, about the, demu the, the future of capitalism, uh, meritocracy, which is something that has been taken for granted for the last generation, is itself now being questioned. So I think these things are, are being questioned, these ideas are being questioned, and my sense is that we, we are undergoing a period of change. However, I think it's important um, I, I feel we, we, we might, we're in danger of missing something. If we talk about what's going on as if it was some kind of gas that's filled the room and if only we could find the windows and doors, open them, the gas would, would disperse. I don't think it's, it's, it's as straightforward as that. There is something else going on because the people who devise and implement these policies, uh, which we've discussed at, at length, do so because they've been taught and, of course, information is disseminated, as, as Callum has said, through, uh, through new processes that are comparable to, to the, impact of, the impact that they have. It's comparable to that of printing press. But I think there are two things, uh, two really fundamental things that are going on. And we, I don't know that they can be changed, but I think we need to come to terms with them before we can, as it were, move on. The first is this, that I think our conception of truth has changed. We, we have completely adjusted our view of what it means to say that something is true. Uh, in days of yore, as it were, in the past, we would have agreed about the, the notion of subjective truth. You talked about a table in the last session. We could all agree that there was a table. Now that's gone. It, objective truth has given way to subjective truth and lived experience. So my truth is not going to be your truth or Heather's truth, um, but it's no less authentic for being my truth. And I can insist that you take my truth seriously and that you don't question it. The second thing that is closely accompanying uh, this subjective notion of truth, and that is that relationships are now interpreted through the prism of power and, the, and through power hierarchies. And we think of people, uh, we think of, uh, of our relationships uh, I I to others in terms of the power hierarchies and our positions in those hierarchies. Now, when we couple those two things together, subjective truth and a view that the world is contaminated by power hi hierarchies, we're going to have a very, very corrupted view um, of of human society. I say corrupted because it'll be very different from the, the, the view that we have had. But I think it's a new view, a new world view. I don't know that they can actually be dismantled. I don't think it can be changed. I don't think we can go back to the way people talk about COVID, um, to the way things were. I think we have to live with what this ghastly phrase, the new normal. I think this is the new normal. I don't know 
where it's leading. Reading Heather's book is actually quite a depressing experience because you think, well, where on earth is this going and where are these people going to end up? Because they end up running the corporations and then those corporations themselves become suffused with this ideology. So I don't have an answer to that, but I don't give up on hope. And I think that hope, we can hope uh, and be, I'll use the word optimistic, be optimistic that in a way we, we, if we it's not that we come to our senses and that we sense we, we go back to, to, um, to the way things were before, but that we will learn to integrate this, what we are experiencing as a, as a corrupted way of looking at life and viewing uh, our relationships with other people. We will, we will adapt and we will adjust and we will come through this to a new form. What that will look like, I don't know, but I can be hopeful that we will. Can I just I come in just on, add, on, I'm sorry. Can I, uh, Peter has raised a, a standard trope, which is that the problem today is we're all relativists and we've given up on the idea of truth. And that's certainly true when it comes to, say, the trans phenomenon, this idea of the infinite malleability of one's identity and, and you know, we all have subjective truths. But to me, that doesn't explain, the left are absolute uh, monists. They, ha they believe in truth. They, they will not accept that the truth of America is not the 1619 Project, is not the fact that America was founded on slavery. So I don't see this alleged nihilism or relativism as necessarily the defining characteristic of the left. Can I respond They to that? will not accept that, you know, the, the Trump's little 1776 project is true. They think they possess the truth. I, I think that's a very important point, and, there, and this is the paradox that, that lies at the heart of this, because on the one hand, they lay claim to a subjective notion of truth, but then claim that that notion of truth is objectively true. And I think that is the intellectual sleight of hand that is being, that is being perpetrated. Um, and it's massively dishonest, it's inconsistent, I think it's, it's immoral and it's corrupt, but it's very real, and I think the impact it's having is very real. I, I, so I agree with you, and I think that's the, that is a, a, a devastating paradox. And I will also say that I'm too much a product of my deconstructive education. I confess to you that I'm one of those, I, outside of science, I actually don't believe in the truth. I've, I've, I've seen too many interpretations of texts to feel confident that there is a single reading of any piece of language. I, I see the, the hermeneutic problem. So I would say, and you suggested this, that we have to move beyond this. We have to come up with a solution that accepts uh, the inevitable nature of interpretation and the fact that we may claim that there's such a thing as common sense, but I would love to know somebody who says, I don't believe in common sense. I, 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 I suspect the left thinks that they are engaged in common sense when they say, well, clearly gender identity is fluid. So, um, well, I act, I, on the other hand, I admit to hypocrisy. Of course I act as if I believe in the truth. Of course, when I write, about the problem of crime and policing. I believe that I am speaking the truth. I, I, one cannot live by epistemological skepticism, and yet as a philosophical matter, I don't see any way around that. Actually, can I just come in, because I was going to, I think, come in saying some of the things you were questioning Peter about, Heather, but there's another thing too, and that is the viewing all relationships as being relationships of power. I think this is an extremely false idea. Um, the most obvious case is if a boss is in love with his secretary, who has the power in that relationship? I mean, it's very, very, it's not clear, of course, perhaps, but nonetheless, it's obviously not simply something that the, the power uh, accrues to the boss. Um, um, if we look at society in a, a broad sense, the power of love, and I'm not being pious here at all, um, it's sometimes very destructive love, but the power of love is extremely important. You cannot, understand, you cannot look at a family, for example, and say, oh, well, the mother and has the power in this relationship, she's often completely helpless before um, a son, uh, particularly, and fathers before daughters. So these, this kind of Marxist, so vulgarized cultural Marxist stress on power, it seems to me to be simply false. 
anyway. Well, except that the person who claims to be the victim then does have does exercise the power, and the victimhood is a response to a perceived power structure. So the, the, you take the boss, for example. If, if the boss makes an inappropriate move on, on, on the employee, yeah. the, the, the power relationship is inverted, and suddenly it's the victim who has the point. power. That was my point. Because, but it's still, yeah. it, 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 the, the society is still, yeah. or that set of relationships is still viewed through the prism of power. It's just that the power is inverted, the relationships are inverted, and it depends upon the status of the victim. But in fact, he doesn't have the greater power. There was, the, well, the classic the actual case that happened was a minister had to resign in London because a few years before he had had a boozy lunch with an attractive political correspondent and on their walking back to the House of Commons he had tried to kiss her. Now she didn't accept the kiss, he didn't persist, um, he didn't, everybody forgot about it until Me Too came into the headlines and then the, she complained about it having happened although there was no sign he'd subsequently nor did she allege he'd subsequently behaved in any way punitively towards her, cut her out of briefings and things. So this was an absurdity. I mean, he shouldn't have, um, I'm sure his wife um, was disapproved, and other people will have differing <laughs> degrees of disapproval of what he did. But it certainly didn't seem to be the kind of thing in which, um, in which he had the power and the political correspondent didn't. It was the other way around. And so, uh, we, well... I've made the point. John, um, John. We, we have five minutes to go. Yes, the gentleman there. Uh, yeah. Yes, I'd like to ask uh, or raise a point, and that is the, the question of self-preservation. Um, and I think human beings have an instinct towards self-preservation. Uh, and I recall uh, reading a, a study of, of gang behavior in the United States. This is like several decades ago which uh, showed that after several years of, of gang violence uh, in which um, you know, a significant number of members of a particular gang died, other young men saw this and they said, you know, we don't want that. I'm not gonna join a gang, I don't wanna die. And, um, and I wonder uh, if that can show us something about some of the problems that uh, uh, you, uh, Heather McDonald, have talked about that uh, intellectuals are, are human beings and they have an instinct towards self-preservation and they can see this nonsense and then they see that it doesn't really work. It doesn't work for them. Um, and uh, the same could perhaps be applied for <clears throat> um, problems in other sectors. Can we, uh, can we, this is obviously the last chance each of you is going to have to say anything. Shall we just go, beginning with Rodrigo and around to us? And I will answer in, in, in 30 seconds. This is actually a nice definition of what I called common sense before, you know, there. And common sense can also be a driving of, uh, of history. And let me give you also a very prosaic example. I mean, uh, it's obvious that people li prefer to pay less for their energy, energy bill than more. Look at uh, nuclear energy. Until four or five years ago, it was a taboo in European circles. It was discarded. No more, uh, uh, no more uh, uh, energy, no more nuclear energy. The minute the bill started to raise by 50 or 100 percent, it came back on the agenda. And even the European Commission said that now it can be accepted as a green transitional energy. So this is what, what I meant. And there, again, I s still have the impression that we are on the right side of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of common sense. And it's true that this instinct for self-preservation is definitely, I mean, maybe a better definition of what I meant by, uh, by common sense. I've talked enough. Well, I'm still waiting. I mean, I think you're right. One would assume that this comes into place. We are living a civilizational experiment of a culture, a civilization that is self-canceling, that is teaching its young people to hate its legacy. And apart from the Chinese Cultural Revolution where you had the masses turning on the elites, I think this is novel of the elites turning on each other and turning on their inheritance and turning on the, the, the culture. So whether that instinct for self-preservation will kick in at some point, and you know, one does wait for, uh, to be honest, I don't like to use this word, and it's a very dangerous word, and it's a very uncomfortable word, but, but the left uses it. The left uses it as a term of opprobrium, 
as I say, all you need to do to discredit an institution or an individual is to call that person white. So at what point are whites going to say, and I'm not for race war, I'm not for necessarily uh, the instantiation of, of antagonistic identity politics, but at some point, whites have to say, uh, we're not taking this bigotry charge, this automatic reflexive charge of bigotry lying down and start defending the inheritance of a tradition that is defined not by whiteness, but by the fact that it has contributed more to the advancement of humanity than any other culture. Uh, Callum? Well, I mean, I just think there's a basic value I think we all need to get back to in society, regardless of what side of the spectrum people are on, which is that, uh, you know, we should judge people based on character. Everything else is pretty shallow. And, and I think there's there so many of the movements today, they've, I mean, you look at the mental health movement, for example, it was, it was founded on an idea of bringing empathy and understanding, but increasingly now it's being weaponized as a way to judge people or indeed to label oneself as an identity. And I just think we've all, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mission creep and people are losing sight sometimes of the purpose of the things that appeared in the culture. Uh, usually it's just to free us up from being judged on simplistic terms and that re results in something quite simple, which is just we should judge people based on the experience of them as a human being. Everything else is uh, nonsense, to be honest with you. Peter? Thank you. I think, um, in Aaron, in response to your question, I think that self-preservation is a very powerful human instinct. How this is work, will work out, um, I, I'm not sure. As I thought about your question and listened to, to my colleagues here, it seems to me that at the moment we are in, in the grip of a, of a mania for self-preservation because the, the people whom Helen, Heather describes in her book are people who are acting like this because they've been taught to act like this, because they believe they're doing so to preserve their own sense of identity, self-worth, uh, safety. Uh, it, so it seems to me that we are still in the grip of self-preservation. I fear that it's not the self-preservation you have in mind. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I will finally, in response to all of my colleagues, put on the dunce cap of optimism and say I have two reasons for my hope. The first is the fundamental conservative social insight. All bad things come to an end. The second is an anti-communist joke from the last days of communism when it was falling. And a group of anti-communist dissidents are sitting in the basement. And one of them is saying, well, it's got to come to an end, of course. But, you know, maybe it won't because they'll never announce it. They, they, they just, the Politburo just will never agree to concede this. And one of them said, no, no, I know that. I think this is how it will be done. One day we'll wake up, turn on the radio, and it will say, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, and having said that, I'd like you, as ladies and gentlemen, to thank our panel for a brilliant discussion.